First and foremost, giving all honor and praise to the creator of the heavens and the earth. We thank him for all his prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We thank him for Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Yeshua, for the new gospel. And we thank him for Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, for the Holy Quran. Peace be upon all those worthy servants. But if we thank him for those great men, surely we must thank him for our modern day leaders. We thank him for Ben Ami HaMashiach, Nasi Shalia, Prince Isaiah Ben Israel, for the messenger, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, and his great student, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and all of the great worthy servants, men and women who fight for justice, peace, and equality on this planet. We greet you all in words of peace. Shalom, shalom. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Reality Check TV. We took a week off last week, but we back on full time. And uh, this was going to be an abbreviated show. It's been such a busy weekend. Getting to the show, I felt it was imperative that we got one on the, on the books, even though the weekend's been so crazy. You can see how I'm dressed. I, Coming from a speaking engagement and some other things today. Didn't really get a chance to change before I did the show, but I had to get one in. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about Trump and this election thing, even though I kind of wanted to put it on the back burner. But they're recommitting themselves or the, using the Electoral College to try to intervene on Trump's inauguration and see if he's going to really be a legitimate president if they're going to allow him to be president of the United States. So I want to speak on that. But before I go into that, I was on Google today searching some things. I just want to search engines that I use. And I seen a, a Google Doodle, which is an image or a picture of one of the greats, Steve Baiko, which is a South African activist who fought heavy against the apartheid. And uh, the reason kind of threw me off because I always see how, and I, you know, I commend whoever does whatever they do because it brings, I think it should bring awareness to a lot of people that didn't know. But a lot of times they take our figures who fought for freedom, fought for justice, fought for equality, fought against white supremacy and they use these figures and their way to benefit them after their deaths but when these men are alive they demonize them they criticize them they ostracize them they delegitimize them in any possible way they you know they can and then 40 years after their death 50 years after their death they bring them back to the forefront or they give you some idea about what they've done but then they contextualize it in the sense that it fits their narrative and they use it as a way to say hey we're not racist hey we're against those atrocities that we've committed throughout history in all scopes in all facets across this planet across this globe and this is another example of which they use great men and women who fought for justice and freedom as a way to shape a narrative that allows you to think that we're in a progressive time. And I'm saying this because we really have to legitimize these claims and what I'm trying to come across or what I'm trying to convey. Because this is the same tactic they used throughout history. With King, with the Panthers, with Malcolm X, with all these so-called figures well, they weren't so-called. They were great men, but how they try to create the narrative, these so-called uh, universalists, that they try to paint a picture to make it seem like they were with them the whole time, or they supported this message, and those were the people of that time, and that was a different America, or that was a different Britain, or that was a different South Africa, or wherever they come from across the planet, Nelson Mandela. These are, they, they use these, these people and these images to try to convey this message that things have changed. But when the reality is we look outside our windows, when we open our front doors, we're still victimized from the same atrocities that we were 
20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago in the time of slavery here in America. The only distinction is, is the methodology in which they use to implement our subligation. That's the only difference. But the overall goal and plan is still intact. It hasn't changed. Hear me now. Take our heroes, our spiritual giants, and don't allow us to see them through the, the true, unfiltered, unadulterated lens that they were at the time what they lived, which put them in a position that ultimately caused their untimely demise. But paint a picture to make it seem like, hey, we're just, with you, we're just like you. And we feel that these atrocities need to be spoken about. While we talk about these greats and all the things that happened in the past, we use this as a smoke screen to cover up and to avert your attention away from what's going on now. Now you say, man, that's a heavy claim. But it's reality. If you can have a group of people, a demographic of people, be so entranced about the past and the atrocities that were committed versus what atrocities are currently happening as we speak and as you listen to this podcast, you feel that you've made some type of progression because it's not as overt in some instances as it was back then, you feel that something has changed. But like I said, the only thing that's changed is how they implement this death and devastation. But the same agenda is still intact. But nevertheless, I want to read a little bit about our brother. And it starts off this one article. This is what we do, we, we read articles and we break it down and give a real in-depth in analysis. Okay, let me get this off the screen. Uh, all right. Even though he died at a young age of 30 in 1977, Steve Biko is considered a luminary among a plethora of great leaders who fought apartheid in South Africa. He was the founder of the Black Conscious Movement, which empowered black people to take pride in their way of life and stand in solidarity with each other. He was also a writer, a human rights activist, and an organizer, and is considered by some of the, as the greatest martyr of the anti-apartheid regime. So let's break that paragraph and a half down. Think about all the things that they're saying that he represented. Black conscious movement. The empowerment and the upliftment of the black people. Giving them pride in their natural indigenous culture and way of life. Unity, solidarity with each other. Building camaraderie, friendship, understanding, bonds. Listen to that. He was also an organizer. This is what brought his demise. And all those same things that they're uplifting and, and characterizing his, his persona as being a positive, strong black man is the same thing if you follow those criteria today. Today, you're considered an enemy combatant. Think about this now. What black men that you know today currently who stand on those positions who are not considered in some form or fashion by the overall populace of this world and of this country, America, as one that preaches hate, bigotry, who, who preaches divisiveness, who will be called so-called black supremacists, or even they go in another greater term now because now they're creating with these a later event that's happened. Terrorists. Gotta hear this. 
this is what happens when you don't control your own narrative. And I, you want to look at the positive and everything that silver lining, at least they somewhat bring them up so that some people can learn about them. But if you don't learn how that affects you today and how that's relevant today and why the enemy is using this as a smoke screen for today, then you're going to fall victim of complacency. You're going to think that you made a substantial gains and you have victory. That you're still not oppressed. That you're still not enslaved. This is what you're going to fall victim of. Now Google is selling, celebrating the 70th anniversary of his birth. He would have been 70 years old today, December 18th, 2016. With a com with a com uh it says, oh, okay. What does it say? Celebrating his birth. Oh, celebrating his birth with, with a doodle, with a drawing, signifying the importance of Vico to his country and the world. So you try to commemorate his birth with a drawing. See what I'm saying? This false narrative that they've given us. If you want to truly celebrate his life, empower those today who are standing on those same principles. Don't give us a drawing or an article on your search engine. Use those billions and billions of dollars that you've generated over the years to help empower those who stand on that principle so that we don't fall victim of those situations ever again. But you don't want to do that because that goes against the reality of what you built your society on. Why would you empower a people that can be separate from you? Because if you empower those people, they create their own search engines. They create their own internet. They create their own civilization. And that makes you or makes them not dependent on your society, which makes you enable to control and manipulate the masses of the planet. You don't want to change. You don't even want to glorify those who came before us, who really fought for freedom, justice, equality, peace, and prosperity. You want to use their name, their works, their deeds for your own benefit and also to keep a people complacent. This is not no conspiracy that we're saying. This is reality. You know how you can tell it's reality? Because you look at the fruit that it bears. And are people not complacent? Do our people not feel like we've made some type of strides that puts us in a position of power? Has the false identity that you are in the best condition you can be as a black man and woman on this planet by being in America? You're here in so-called conscious and freedom fighters tell you that. Well, I'd rather be here still than any other place in the world. How can you say that? And you have the ability to create your own reality. You don't have to accept this. But you don't want to be free. I want to be free. Black is beautiful. They know from Google. On his, on his website said so Steve Michael said and knew this fully well and fought to spread this message across South Africa at the height of the apartheid movement in the 1960s and 70s at the height so when everybody was screaming racism white supremacy apartheid keeping that Divide, keeping a small portion of Europeans controlling the masses of African indigenous people. Like they did the colonization of all of Africa and all of this planet. And still to this day, because of those who actually been to South Africa know, because they have a black president and face, the same still white supremacists control the resources of their country. 
control the politics, control the finances, control the consciousness, most important, and the energy of the people by disillusionment. But they give you a character to make you think that progress is at hand. He studied medicine in the University of Natal. He created the South African Students Organization and in 1968 became his first leader. Young man. After, so this goes out to all those youth that think they can't do nothing. 20s and 30s. You got the power and position to change your predicament right now. Grab forth to the teachings of those who came before us, our spiritual giants. Connect with the elders and use your youth and their wisdom to empower ourselves and to bring forth this salvation and implement the necessary solutions that we know but we are afraid to implement to bring forth our freedom and justice. After he was expelled from medical school in 1972, because he was a freedom fighter. He started working full time on the cause leading the government to restrict his, his movement and activities to the point of prohibiting him from meeting more than one person at a time. See what they put you under? When you stand for uh, freedom and justice and peace and prosperity? See what type of reality they give you? They don't want you to be free. All the great things that our leaders have done, look how they try to diminish your life. Let's think about this. Despite that, he continued his activities and taking part in organizing the Soweto Uprising where police opened fire on student protesters. Same tactics are being used today. Police still gunning you down. And you don't even have to be a protester. You got to be black. You got to be anti-establishment or against their way of what establishment should be. The anti-apartheid icon died while in police custody in September 1977 after he was arrested in Port Elizabeth and for interrogate. Uh, I'm sorry. He was interrogated and then took him to Pretoria for medical attention. So after his interrogation, which was his beating, they interrogated him. After, that means they brutalized him, brutalized him, excuse me, and almost beat him to death. Well, ultimately they did beat him to death, but let me get to that point. And then took him to Pretoria for medical attention. So if you're asking somebody questions, which is what interrogation is supposed to be, how do you have to take them to medical attention? Otherwise, you had the whole time had attentions on killing this brother. Even though the police first claimed he died a week after a week-long hunger strike, it later came out that he had suffered uh, a hit to the head against the wall doing a shuffle. Come on. Stop it. See how they try to see, that's why you can't, even with this, you so-called uplifting his name, you still can't tell the truth. You know, good and well, it wasn't no shuffle. The police officers wanted to silence him once and for all. Just like they want to do with anybody else today who speaks on truth. They might try to do it with your brother right here. If he keeps putting out this reality. And, and, and continues to fight for freedom, justice, and equality, and going against oppression. You hear the lies they use? That sound familiar? He died after a long, uh, week-long hunger strike. They told you our sister down there hung herself in the police cell after they arrested her on a bogus traffic stop. Sandra Bland. Come on. It's the same white supremacy. It ain't changed. Nowhere, no matter where you are on this globe, 
It's the same white supremacy. No matter what name you use, alt-right, KKK, Republican, Democrat, it don't matter. America, it's the same. Whatever name you want to use, I know you say, oh, it's a country name. It's a no, 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 no. America don't represent the geographical location in which we are currently located. It represents the name of the corporation, the mentality of what was implemented after the reign of the Euro Gentile at, on this uh, region, on this landmass. So yeah, America can be racist. Because it represents an idea. It's the name of a country. That means it's it be has it is a proper noun at that point. It represents a people. Because America wasn't a, this land was here before it was called America. And before it was called America, it was a different reality on this land. So when we say we gotta leave America, you gotta leave America. And even if it's not physically, it's mentally and spiritually. Because when you say, well, we was, on, we was here in America. But when you was here, it wasn't called America. And the, the things that's done here in America weren't being done. It's a different reality. Names have powers. They have meanings. So all of the negative things that have been done in the name of America... It doesn't even carry the spirit of something that we should even have connected to our very nature. Let's look at this thing in a whole other way. We gotta wake up. We gotta wake up. I'm gonna read one quote from my brother, and then I'm gonna go ahead and go to the other subject because you're only dealing with a limited time. But it says the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those they impress. So, basically, from what I interpret that means, you can have your own interpretation, but they only can go as long as you allow them to go. They only have as much power as you allow them to have. Once you stand on who you are, and refuse to be a slave, refuse to be oppressed, refuse to be destroyed and killed and maimed, they don't have the power no more. They can't do it to you. Take back the power that you have. Return back to your very essence and your very nature. Free yourself. Stand on truth. And from that point, you're never even fit to be a slave. But I'm going to change, change the subject real quick. Hmm. Go to the... What's going on tomorrow? So, the Electoral College meets tomorrow. On Monday, 538 people will meet to determine who will be the next president. <laughs> if, and the reason I'm only bringing this up because I want to show you how unfree you actually are. In the land of democracy, in the land of the free, the most powerful nation on the planet. How do you think they became powerful? By rigging the game. By stacking the chips for their favor. So you're telling me that we elected a president or we got a president that we technically didn't elect because he didn't receive more of the popular vote. And now, to show that the system already was crooked by we knowing that you can lose the popular vote but yet and still win the electoral college, which most people still don't understand to this very day. Not only that, you're going to have another election where this time you're not even going to even speak about a popular vote. 
You're not even going to bring the masses of this inhabitation of America, of the population of America, to vote again. You intervene by using the delegates who are handpicked, mind you, just to show you who are some of the delegates. Bill Clinton, yeah, William Clinton, the former president, wife of Hillary Clinton, was a delegate. That means he had a vote in the Electoral College. So he was the ones who cast a vote who really mattered for New York. So that people. So America, there's really no reason for you to redo it because you picked who you wanted to be in office. Let's look at this another way. These meetings of the Electoral College convene in every state and the District of Columbia. Just that's just shy of six weeks after election day. Have long been little more than a formality. But the victory of President elect Donald J. Trump, who lost the popular vote, but is projected to win the most electoral votes, has thrust the Electoral College into the spotlight once more. The conclusion of American intelligence agencies that Russia tried to intervene in the election to harm Hillary Clinton's campaign has only intensified focus in recent days. President Obama on Friday described the Electoral College originally a compromise between those who wanted Congress to choose the president and those who favored a popular vote. As a vestige. As, elector, as electors gathered in state capitals across the country, here's a rundown of what comes next. Let's break that down real quick. Let's digest that. It's a lot, it's a lot in that. And we're not going to be able to cover it all, but I want to talk on some points. First, President Obama, you know the history of America. And it wasn't, you, you say the word, see that the language is so key, that's why we got to understand language and how it can be confusing and, and deceptive in how they give it to us. A compromise between who wanted Congress to choose and the, pres and the people to choose. I don't see any compromise if the people still can't choose their president. Well, you say Yusuf. This has only been a couple of cases where the president who won the popular vote or did not win the popular vote won electoral college and electoral votes and became president. Well, that's because they have a system that's set up that you are so easily swayed and manipulated. For one, they only give you a handful of choices. So their choices are usually both they're good either way but because you are so null and void of real of what's really going on and what's really happening what's happening excuse me and how devious and nefarious and insidious these people in this city in this uh, system is that you disregard the fact that you're not choosing your president and they're convincing you who to pick so that it looks like the Electoral College and the popular vote are one and the same. They coincide that you produce through the popular vote the choices of the Electoral College. But that's who they were going to pick anyway. So with only two candidates in most instances, well, you can say they got the, the Green Party or the other. You don't care about those. Nobody really picks those. They already, that's just for show. So you only have two choices. And through the news and the media, the, these news cycles, they put out disparaging information on whatever candidate they really don't want to back. So now you are swayed in the direction of the other candidate. Thinking one is a better or have more better morals than the other one. Or we can be a better leader or this or that. It's the same coin, just different, two different sides. Two sides of the same coin. Democrat, Republican is the same thing. 
But this is just a great example of how America is showing you you don't have no true freedom. You don't have no real free choice. We're going to make the choices and give you the losing of choice. But this time, we're so confident in your ignorance and your inability to produce any type of freedom or self-sustainable ability for yourself that we're going to tell you you don't pick the president. We're going to show you don't pick the president. We're going to pick someone who has such visceral against their name. Whatever you throw against him, it doesn't stick. And we're still going to pick him, make him the president, and you're not going to have nothing you can do about it. And this is crazy because middle class white people and well-off people are shocked in this time and age because they feel like this can't happen to them. They are the losers. They're free too. Damn. No. It's a handful of people that's really running this show. And everybody else just falls in place. You're playing a position. We confused because we think on a on a chessboard of life that we have a better position or I'm just a pawn or I'm a bishop or I'm a queen or I'm a king. You're still being moved by somebody else. So whatever title you have on the chessboard of life, you're still being positioned and moved by outside force. So you are limited in your ability to make any type of real change. Long as you restrict yourself to those positions. And that's what's happening. President, you're just a piece on the game, on the board of life. While the other forces meticulously move you in position to do their bidding. In short, who are the electors? It poses a question. In short, the electors are people chosen by their state political parties to cast votes for president and vice president. So this is critical too. Electors can be state party leaders or elected officials. Somebody who's already been groomed and put in position to understand the play. Understand what is at hand. Understand their position and role. Not somebody that they can't control or radical. No, no, no. Somebody that's already been in position. Sometimes... There are individuals with a personal connection to a presidential candidate. Duh. Like we said earlier, excuse me, like we said earlier, Bill Clinton with his wife Hillary. The number of electors each state has is equal to the number of representatives and senators it has in Congress, making 100, 538 in total. With those extra three electors coming from the District of Columbia. One representative, two senators. But what is so crucial is that it says electors will meet in each state, typically at the Capitol, where they will cast two votes, one for the president and one for the vice president. So you can technically get <laughs> Hillary's vice president and Trump as president. Or you can get Hillary as president and you can get Trump's vice president as her vice president, which is Mike Pence. See the games that they play? You don't have no control under the system. Wake up. There's more to go, but I'm not going to go that much longer. I'm going to stop around here. But I just want to say, as we look at this system, the best way to really get your freedom is not to participate. And not only do you not participate in just the voting, because if you don't vote and still participate in every other aspect of this society, you're not doing nothing. You're a joke. But I'm saying you're not participating. I mean totally separating yourself from the system. You say, I got to eat, I got to do you're absolutely right. Within that, build up a coalition, build up a community where you can start to sustain yourself without relying on 
this society as a crutch. And let that be the impetus on which you start to produce your own government. But that's all I'm going to say on that. Because that can get me arrested. Hey, you can be any other place on the planet, but you decided to be here and give us your ear. I'm going to be back this upcoming week at the end of the year. And we're going to really break down a law. That's why I was going to be short on this one. Because it's probably be at least an hour or maybe more. Because I'm going to break down the year events and what's been going on and, uh, in America. And that's coming up. And uh, next week is going to be a good one too, going around the time of Christmas, I'm going to post one, giving the true history of uh, what, really, what Christmas really means from a historical aspect, uh, along the lines of what it means as far as the media and our miseducation. But I want to thank everybody for watching, I want to thank all our great leaders out there and freedom fighters, those who fight for peace and quality, and the new young brothers too, the Tariqs, the uh, Umars, and I can go down the list, I mean all the great brothers and sisters. Uh, keep up the great work and disseminating this information. But most importantly, the listeners, you have to be proactive in your own salvation and your own freedom. If you don't participate in it, can't nobody give it to you. So we got to stop expecting somebody else to do the work that was put by God Almighty in us to accomplish and to achieve. So as we leave, in the words of peace, shalom, shalom, and the wonderful sounds of the Commodores. This is why I am. Thank you very much.